Welcome back to Parking Full Time. I'm Big Dave, the Parks Professor. And I want to specifically welcome you to this Bible study and prayer time. The goal of Parking Full Time is to display the glory of God's creation by exploring America one park at a time. But the God who created this world is the same God who sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross, pay for our sins, and save this world. And that's what these Bible study and prayer time videos are designed to highlight. This is the third of three videos where we're studying Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion in John chapters 18 and 19. Uh, we've seen Jesus get betrayed. We've seen him get arrested, get falsely accused, uh, get convicted at a show trial. We've seen him beaten illegally. And the last verse we studied last time was John chapter 19 and verse 16, which says, they deliver, Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. He's been sentenced to die, and they're getting ready to carry out that execution. In all of this, we're seeing man do his worst, and we're getting ready to see God give his best. So let's pick up where we left off last time, which is chapter 19 and verse 17. <clears throat> let's look at verse 17 here, and I'll probably be doing a little bit of coughing and such during this video. I have a little bit of uh, chest congestion from uh, a cold that I'm just getting over, so just please bear with me here. Uh, verse 17, uh, John chapter 19, verse 17, it says, And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him, and two other with him, on either side, one, and Jesus in the midst. This place mentioned here in verse 17, uh, the place which in the Hebrew is called Golgotha, uh, that's what it's called in the Hebrew language. In the Latin language, it's called Calvary, and those are two words from two different languages, but they mean the same thing. They mean the place of a skull. Uh, the hill that Jesus was crucified on, it looked like a skull, and hence the name Golgotha or Calvary. Again, two words from two, diff two different languages. They mean the same thing. They mean the place of a skull. As a little historical background here, in the Roman tradition, uh, the one who had been sentenced to die had to carry his cross, or at least part of his cross, to the place where he was going to be executed. That was a mark of his guiltiness. And Jesus at least starts to do that here. At the beginning of verse 17, it says, And he, and he refers to Jesus, and he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull. So Jesus at least starts to do that. He uh, picks up his cross and he starts to carry it to the place where he's going to be executed. Now, some other Gospels give us a little bit more information, and so let me uh, write down a reference here. I'm going to write down uh, Mark chapter 15 and verse 21. Mark chapter 15 and verse 21. And the Gospel writer Mark, he tells us that Jesus, in fact, couldn't carry his cross the whole way, probably because he was weakened physically from the beating he had endured earlier in the chapter here. And so because Jesus couldn't carry his own cross the whole way, uh, the Roman soldiers, they actually compelled Simon of Cyrene to carry it for him. So another gospel writer adds a little bit more detail here. And likewise down here where it talks about um, the two people that were crucified uh, with Jesus, one on either side, uh, on either side one and Jesus in the midst, Again, we know a little more information about these people, and so let me write down another reference that I'm not going to turn here. I'm going to write down a Luke chapter 23, verses uh, 39 through 43. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. <clears throat> and they tell us a little bit more about these two people. Uh, in fact, they're thieves. Uh, possibly they were accomplices of Barabbas, whom we talked about last time. Um, it talks about these two thieves who were crucified with him. And there are a lot of good things that can be said about that. Many of good, many good sermons have been preached um, talking about um, Simon of Cyrene uh, 
being compelled to carry his cross in Mark chapter 15. Many good sermons have been preached about uh, the two thieves that were crucified alongside Jesus uh, in Luke 23. Um, but John here, he doesn't tell us a lot about those people. John keeps the focus on Jesus. He keeps the focus on Jesus and on what Jesus did. And I want to do the, rather than get sidetracked on some other things, I want to do the same thing with this particular study. Now, another historical background thing happens next. Look at the next couple of verses here. Uh, verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then, then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Now, again, a little bit of cultural background about what happens here. Uh, in their culture, Hebrew was the Jews' language, the language of the the language of religion, the language of the local religious people. Greek was the common language of communication in the Roman Empire. Latin was the official language of Rome. And remember, this was the Passover feast. So people would have come, they would have been in Jerusalem from all over the Roman Empire, from all over the region. And so when they came to, when they were coming to the Passover and they came to this particular place right here, it didn't matter where they were from or what language they spoke, they would have been able to read what Pilate wrote. He wrote it in three different languages, all of which were common in the empire, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And when he wrote what he wrote, when he wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, uh, Pilate was actually more right than he realized, and I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Uh, when he wrote that, prob probably Pilate meant this as a mocking of the Jews, uh, and we think that based on the Jewish leader's reaction to what he wrote here. Look at uh, the next couple of verses, look at verse 21. Uh, then said the chief priests uh, of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. That is, write down, uh, make it clear that he's being accused of sedition, of insurrection here. And Pilate doesn't have any of that. Verse 22, uh, Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, Pilate was more right than he realized. Um, Jesus is, in fact, the king of the Jews. In fact, he's more than that. In fact, he's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. He's the ruler of all creation. He's the creator of the universe that we see on a daily basis. And when, so when Pilate writes this here, when he writes Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, and he writes it in these three common language, um, even though probably it's not quite what Pilate meant, in fact, Pilate was telling everyone, regardless of what language they spoke, he was telling everyone exactly who that was hanging on that cross. Regardless of your language, you could see, you could see what he is and who he was. I thought about this, and you know, the same thing happens when you're out hiking and you see the glory of God's creation in its natural state. You see the waterfalls the mountains, the trees, the lakes. You see the beauty and complexity of God's creation. And that kind of beauty and complexity, if you think about it, that's not going to happen just by pure chance. Uh, I'm a retired mathematician. The probability of all of the beauty and complexity that we see in God's creation, the probability of that happening by pure chance is statistically zero. Someone had to create that. And when you see that, when you see the, the beauty and the complexity of the creation, that's someone, someone who's strong enough and smart enough to create everything that we see, that someone would have to be God. A uh, man can't even create a sweet gum tree, one of the most common trees here in my part of the world. We can plant a seed and let God's creation do its regular thing, but create a sweet gum tree out of nothing? No, that's impossible for us. We can't do that. It's impossible for us, but it's easy for God. And regardless of your language, regardless of your culture and your background, 
if you think about it, you calculate the probabilities, what you see it, in the world around you, it doesn't happen by chance. There has to be a God. So there's one cultural thing there. There's another Roman cultural thing that happens next here. I'll look at the next couple of verses. I'll look at verse 23 up here. Uh, it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts. They divided them into four parts. Uh, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, Therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, because it was without seam, it was a single piece of fabric, and therefore it was very valuable. Uh, tearing it apart would have greatly decreased the value. <coughs> uh, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. The key phrase I want you to notice here is this phrase right here in the middle of verse 24, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And that comes up here. It's going to come up uh, in a couple of other places. What these Roman soldiers are doing here in their tradition, uh, the Roman tradition was for the soldiers who were doing the execution to become owners of the crucified person's clothes. And that's what happens here. They're going through his clothes and they're taking ownership of the crucified person's clothes. But there's more than that going on here. There's more things going on behind the scenes. The thing that John wants us to notice and the thing I, that I want you to notice is that all of these things that are happening, they're happening that the scripture might be fulfilled. Um, let me write down another reference here, one scripture that this is probably referring to here. And I'm going to write down um, Psalms chapter 22 and verse 18. Psalms chapter 22 and verse 18. Uh, that psalm was written several hundred years before this event happens. And I've mentioned this before, but when you read all of the things that happens here, uh, when you read uh, all the things that happen to Jesus, how he gets betrayed, how he gets arrested, um, how he gets convicted at a show trial, um, how he gets um, mocked, uh, how he gets beaten, uh, how he's getting ready to die here. Jesus looks helpless here. He's hanging on a cross, getting ready to die. He's been treated like a common criminal. But in fact, even though he looks helpless, he's in total control of this situation. Nothing that happens here, of all these really bad things that we read... Most of them are really bad. We're going to get to something here in a minute that's not really bad. But most of the things that we read here in John chapters 18 and 19, most of these things are really bad. They're really evil things. None of them would have happened except he allowed it. This act that was just a common act according to Roman tradition, this act, in fact, it fulfills scriptures given by God himself several hundred years before this event happened. He looks helpless. He's not. He's in total control of what happens here. Now, I mentioned something good was going to happen. There's, it's hard to find anything good happening in these two chapters. But here's something that I really like this next bit here. Look at verses 25 through 27. Verse 25. Um, now, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. So there were four women standing there. Uh, when Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Now, it mentions a disciple twice here. In verse 26, he's called the disciple standing by whom he loved, whom Jesus loved. And then in verse 27, he's just called the disciple. Um, the Bible doesn't directly tell us which disciple this is. Uh, most people think it's John, the writer of this gospel. I agree with that, although for reasons that are too technical for this video. 
But the thing I, re I really want you to notice, I want you to notice how much Jesus loved his mother. Uh, if I had maybe planned a little bit better, I could have done this video for Mother's Day a few weeks ago, but we just didn't get this far that fast. Jesus really loved his mother, and it wasn't just his mother whom Jesus really loved. Jesus really loved people. Um, I'm going to write down a reference that we studied a few weeks ago. Uh, John chapter 13 and verse 1. John chapter 13 and verse 1. And in John chapter 13 and verse 1, it talks about Jesus' love for his disciples. And it says that Jesus loved them unto the end. And I unpacked that phrase a few videos ago. Uh, the idea there, Jesus loved them to the uttermost. He loved them as much as anyone could possibly love someone. And you see that same kind of love for his mother here. Now, legally, Jesus' brothers, or half-brothers actually in his case, legally they should have been the ones to look after his mother. But remember, they didn't believe in him at this time. They would later in the book of Acts, but not yet. And in addition to that, this isn't a legal matter. This is a personal matter. He tells his best, most, most faithful disciple, the disciple who's standing by him through all of this, he tells him, take care of my mother. And notice that disciple's response here. It's a very faithful response. There's a lot we can learn from this. It says, and from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Jesus wanted to make sure his mother got cared for. And the great thing about that disciple, again, I think it's John. The great thing about John, John does it. John takes care of Jesus' mother. He does what Jesus tells him to do. He's faithful. Really beautiful scene there and really a lot for us to learn from that scene right there. Unfortunately, next we go back to man doing his worst. Look at uh, verse 28 here. Uh, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Again, I'll underline this phrase again. I underlined it once before, uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Um, probably the scripture he's referring to here is Psalm 69, verse 21. And so I'll write that in here. Psalm chapter 69, verse 21. Uh, this what's about to happen here in verse 29 this also fulfills scripture and again to reinforce my main point here uh, Jesus looks helpless when you read John chapters 18 and 19 he looks helpless but he's not he's in total control things happen exactly the way God wants them to and what happens here is in verse 29 look at verse 29 uh, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. What's described here, this would have been the normal way to give someone hanging on a cross something to drink. Uh, Jesus can't reach out and pick up a cup like you and I would because his arms are nailed to the wood. Uh, also, they couldn't reach up to his mouth uh, because with their arms because he's elevated above the ground. Uh, you couldn't quite reach that high. You could almost reach that high, but not quite. And so what they did is they put a sponge on a stick. Uh, they put it on a branch of hyssop in this case. And they used the stick to reach it up to his mouth. Now with the hyssop, there's also some imagery um, that's pulled out of the Old Testament. And that, that goes deep. I don't want to get into that in this video. But the next verse here in verse 30 and the next verse is the key phrase really in this entire chapter. Let me turn the page and look up here at verse 30, John chapter 19, verse 30. It says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That phrase there, it is finished, I'm going to box that. Uh, I've underlined a couple of other things, but I'm going to box this for a little bit more emphasis. That phrase, it is finished, that's the key phrase in this entire chapter. Now, that phrase, it is finished, of course, it implies completion. It implies finality. But in fact, in this case, it implies a little bit more than that. 
And let me try to get you to see this. Let's look at something we studied a couple of weeks ago. Let's look back at John chapter 17 and verse 4. John chapter 17 and verse 4. Uh, this was his high priestly prayer, his so-called high priestly prayer. Uh, the prayer of one who overcomes the world, as I call it back in uh, back when we studied this. So let's flip back a couple pages here. Jesus talked about things being finished. Right? And he used that in, in when he was praying to God the Father in his high priestly prayer. So let's look at John chapter 17. Notice what he says about finishing here. What he finished, what he says about finishing here in John chapter 17, verse 4. Uh, he's praying to God the Father, and he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. And then notice this next phrase here. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Yeah, it's not, when Jesus cries, it is finished, it's not just a, a statement of finality, although it is that. But it's more than that. What Jesus is talking about is the same thing he's talking about here in when he prays to the Father. John chapter 17, verse 4, when he cries out, it is finished, he's saying, I finished the work that God the Father gave me to do. You see, the Father had sent him as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, to pay the death payment that we couldn't pay, the, to, the sinless perfect death payment that's required for sin. And when he cries, it is finished here, at the, in John chapter 19, verse 30, when he cries, it is finished, what he's saying is, he's, he's paid it. He's paid that perfect death payment that had to be paid for sin. That perfect death payment that had to be paid for sin is paid. It's finished. The work he's been sent to do is finished. And it's the last thing he says here on the cross. The last part of verse 30, it says, And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. Uh, literally, the phrase that the, the King James renders here, gave up the ghost, uh, literally it reads, He handed over his spirit. Nobody forcibly took his spirit from him. He handed it over. His body died. Uh, he was as physically dead as anyone has ever been. But his spirit never did. He handed over his spirit. I bring that up because some people think that when you die, that's it. That's the end of your existence. And no, we see here and we see a lot of places in the Bible, but this is one of them. When we look at Jesus' death, we see, no, there's more to you than just your body. There's the ghost, as the King James calls it. There's your spirit. Uh, elsewhere, it's called your mind, your will, your soul, as the Bible sometimes calls it. Yeah, your body dies, but your spirit lives on. What happens to your spirit? What happens to your soul after your body dies, well, that depends on what you believe. I'll say more about that in a minute here. But look at the next verse here. Look at verse 31. Uh, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation uh, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, uh, for that Sabbath day was a high day, uh, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, again, a little bit of um, medical background, historical background here. When you're hanging on a cross, as Jesus and the other two malefactors were, when you're hanging on a cross, you have to push yourself up with your legs and pull yourself up with your arms to alleviate pressure on your chest cavity so that you can take your next breath. And so if your legs are broken, well, that means you can't put any weight on your legs well, your arms are going to get tired in that case really fast, and therefore you die of asphyxiation much more quickly. That's what's going on right here in verse 31. They do a little more than that, though. Look at verse 32. Uh, then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. They broke the legs of the other two thieves, the other two malefactors. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came out blood and water. 
Now, probably what this soldier does here when he takes a spear and pierces Jesus' side, um, probably that's to make double sure that he's dead. Maybe it was just an act of brutality, but probably it's to make double sure that he's dead. And notice here when he did that, uh, it says, And forthwith immediately came out blood and water. Now, this blood and water that comes out, this isn't something magical or mystical here. Um, they've done medical tests on cadavers. They put cadavers through the kind of um, physical treatment that Jesus goes through here. And what those medical tests show, they show that when a person's chest has been severely injured, but not pierced like Jesus's was, what happens is that up to two liters of hemorrhage fluid gathers around the rib cage and the lungs. And so when the rib cage is finally pierced, as Jesus's was when they when the soldier thrust in the spear, thrust the spear into his side, all of that fluid comes out. The blood and all of the other fluid that had been hemorrhaged, it all comes out. And that's the blood in the water here. It's all of the all of the fluid that had been internally hemorrhaged because of the physical injuries that Jesus took when the soldier pierced his side with the spear, that fluid, the blood and the water, all of the fluid, it comes gushing out. And that's what happens there. It's a, a really grisly sight, but um, that's the way this world is. Now, verse 35. Verse 35 is the key verse, actually, for, or at least the key idea in the entire gospel. So verse 35, And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. He that saw it, that's John the Evangelist, the writer of this gospel. And his record is true. His record, that's the gospel, that's what we're reading right now. He that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true. Now notice this next phrase, that ye might believe. That ye might believe. I'm going to box that. That's another key phrase here. It is finished as a key phrase in terms of what the events that actually took place. But this phrase here, that ye might believe, that's the key phrase really in the entire Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to see it again when we get into verse 20, or, or into chapter 20. And I'll say a little more about it here at the end of, the, of this video, but I want to get to the end of the chapter first. Um, look at verses 36 and 37. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. I'll write in a couple of other scriptural references here. Um, for the first one, so a bone of him shall not be broken. Um, that's a quote of Psalm chapter 34 and verse 20. So I'll write that in Psalms chapter 34 and verse 20. <clears throat> and again, this phrase comes up that the scripture should be fulfilled. I'll underline that again. Uh, that phrase come, that's like the third time in this chapter that that phrase has come up. And then this other scripture that they reference here in verse 37, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Um, that idea actually comes up a couple of times in the Old Testament. The most direct reference is Zechariah, of all places. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. So I'll write that reference in there. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And again, both of these things are done here. John tells us both of these things happen so that the scripture should be fulfilled. And I've made this point a couple of times, but it's worth making again because it's really important. Uh, Jesus looks really helpless here, but he's not. He did exactly what the Father sent him to do. He finished the work that the Father had sent him to do. He was completely in control of this situation all the time. And it happened exactly as God had planned. It happened so the scriptures should be fulfilled. Now there's a little cleanup here at the end of the chapter. Let's look at the last few verses and then I'll make a concluding comment here. Uh, and then we'll look at the prayer list and close out this video. Uh, verse 38, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. I'm going to underline that. That phrase is going to appear a few times here in these last few verses. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, he uh, asked Pilate that he might have the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. Pilate granted him his request. 
He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Again, I'll underline that, the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Uh, we studied him back in uh, John chapter 3, um, quite a few videos ago at this point. So Nicodemus came and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, again that phrase comes up again, then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, a new tomb, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand, it was near to the place where he was crucified. The Romans' way of doing things uh, for people who were, who were executed for sedition, for insurrection, the normal thing that the Romans would have done is they would have left the body hanging on the cross for days and days and days, and literally, they would have let the vultures come and pick it apart. Uh, in the Romans' way of thinking, that was a kind of a final shame and indignity for that particular crime. But here we read about a couple of people who, who weren't going to let that happen. In verse 38, there's Joseph of Arimathea. And in verse 39, there's Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus appears earlier in uh, John chapter 3. I've uh, already, um, uh, which, which again, we studied many videos ago. Now, this man here, Joseph of Arimathea, um, he is mentioned exactly one time in each of the four Gospels. And the one time he is mentioned is for this particular incident, for the care that he did for the body of Jesus. And that's the really important thing I want you to notice here. The thing that Joseph of Arimathea and also Nicodemus, the thing they do has to do with the body of Jesus. I've underlined that three times, once in verse 40 and twice back here in verse 38. They did these things to the body of Jesus. His spirit had left the body back in verse 30. Back in verse 30 when, his, when uh, it says he gave up the ghost, that's where his spirit left the body. You see, there's more to you than just your body. And that leads me to my final thought, which leads me back to the key phrase in the entire Gospel of John, back here in, the, in verse 35. And he that saw it bear record, again, he that saw it is John the Evangelist, the writer of this Gospel, and his record, his record is this Gospel, his record is true, and he, that, and he knoweth that he saith true. John is certain that the things he said here is, is true, is correct. And then the, the phrase I want to close with, this phrase that I boxed here when we studied this, he does all of this. He bears record. He preserves his record. He tells you he's certain this record is true. He does all of this that you might believe. That you might believe. You see, what happens to your spirit after your body dies depends on what you believe. You see, the Bible says we've all sinned. Um, we've all done things that God has told us not to do and failed to do things God has told us to do. And the Bible goes on to say the penalty for that sin is death. We owe a death payment because we've sinned. But as we've just read about, Jesus lived a perfect sinless life and paid our death payment when he died on the cross. That's what we just read about him doing. Jesus, he finished his, the work that God the Father had given him to do. He finished the payment, uh, the, the perfect payment for sin that had to be paid. It is finished, he said. So he paid our death payment, and we can have that death payment applied to us. We can have everlasting life by believing in him. That's why John is so concerned here that you might believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and we've just read about that giving right here. God giving his only begotten son. He did that, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You may wonder, well, what does it mean to believe in him? Well, it means to trust. Stop trusting yourself. Stop trusting in your own goodness, any goodness you might think you have. 
Stop trusting in whatever else you're trusting in. Start trusting in the death payment he paid for your sin. I did that over 30 years ago. And God's promised in here in the Gospel of John that when my body dies, my spirit will live forever with the Lord. That's the everlasting life he's promised. I believe this record. I hope you've done that too. And if you haven't, now's a great time to believe in him. Uh, there's no prayer to pray. There's no church to go to. There's no money payment to pay. Eternal life doesn't have anything to do with any of that. Eternal life is about what you believe. Believe in him and him alone. If you do that, you'll have eternal life. When you die, your spirit will go to be with him. I hope you'll do that. I close each of these Bible study and prayer times with a brief look at my prayer list. Uh, some things I'm praying for right now, I'm praying for our country and its leaders. Uh, we desperately need that right now. Uh, we, I'm praying that more people will believe in him, that more people will have this eternal life that he's promised. Uh, I'm praying for power and protection for preachers of the gospel. Uh, for people who are trying to convince other people to believe in him, like I'm doing here. I'm praying that new believers will grow, will learn to trust him more. I'm praying that believers will care for each other. And so I'm going to take a few minutes and pray for these things. I hope you'll do the same. Until next time, I am Big Dave, the Parks Professor, for Parking Full Time. Have a great afternoon, take care, and Lord bless. <laughs>